Hi, my name is Tom Britton. Uh, I'm professor at the Department of Mathematics at Stockholm University. Uh, my background is probability and statistics, uh, where I've been re doing research for the last 20 years, and quite a lot of my research has been in uh, infectious disease modeling. So that is what I will talk about today, uh, and with particular focus on the corona, current corona outbreak. Uh, before I start, uh, let me just say that I'm not an expert on uh, virology, nor am I an, am an expert on prevent practical uh, aspects of preventive measures. But I do know modeling, so that's what I will talk about. Before I talk about mathematical modeling, let's talk a little bit about reality. So here we see uh, the, uh, the number of reported cases of the corona outbreak outside of China. Uh, and it goes up until March the 3rd this year to uh, 2020. Uh, so if you see a curve like this, you might try to ask some questions. Uh, one is, of course, how many will get infected? That's the, the, the uh, $10,000 question right now. Another one is, when will the peak be and how big will the peak be? That's important for health uh, Public health, uh, another is what happens if we insert a lot of different preventive measures? How, how can we reduce the number of infected? And also what type of data should we collect beside these number of reported cases to make our statements more precise? I will not only talk about the corona outbreak, so I'll also give some other graphs. So here is one graph of an endemic disease. This data comes from Germany, but I think it's endemic in most uh, countries in the Western Hemisphere. And this is for rotavirus, and we see the, uh, the reported incidence over a 10-year period. And we see this very reg obvious regularity that there is a peak every year, and then it drops down. And then there's another peak. The size of the peaks vary a little bit, so that's one question why uh, people might uh, ask. Uh, another type you might, uh, thing you might want to know is, what is the average age at which people get infected? That's quite often obtained in the data. But you could also ask questions like, suppose now that we start vaccinating against this, how much will the, will the, uh, the incidence be reduced? And is it possible by means of vaccination to, to make these curves drop down to close to zero? Another question in this particular data set that I've been working a little bit on is, can we from this type of data say anything about the underreporting? But because, of course, not everyone that has a rotavirus reports this to a medical doctor. For instance, the symptoms are very mild for, uh, for adults, so maybe there is a big fraction of underreporting. Can we say anything about this from the, the data? Here is another curve, and this is a historic curve. It, comes, it, it uh, concerns measles. And it is the number of reported cases uh, between 1948 and 1968. And uh, uh, the top curve is from Great Britain, whereas the lower one is from the small country of Iceland, which is an isolated island in the Atlantic Sea. So there are two striking differences. Maybe the most striking difference is the regularity but the difference in regularity, we see that the peaks are more frequent in Great Britain and less frequent in Iceland. If you look closer, the peaks in, in Great Britain are not every year, but every other year. It's well known that when, when, people, uh, when children come back to school, that's when there is, there is a start of a new outbreak usually. But of course, uh, they go to school every year, not every other year in UK. So why? Are there not peaks every year? Well, sort of the simple explanation for that is that suppose there was an outbreak this year, this autumn, then the next autumn, everyone except the first graders will have been infected and are hence immune. So the, the first graders are not a big enough group to, to start a new outbreak. Whereas one year later, it's the first and the second year graders that uh, are susceptible to the disease, and then that's enough to get a, a new epidemic going. The same applies to Iceland, but maybe they are less densely populated there, so there you have to wait four years in order to be what's called super critical. But another difference between the, these two graphs is that in the top one, you see that measles is maintained in UK all through. So there, there are fewer cases in the, in, the spring and, uh, in the spring, but there are still cases around, whereas in Iceland we see it drops actually down to zero. So then quite a lot of researchers have been trying to understand uh, 
And this has to do with the size of the com population in Great Britain. So the more people there are, the, the more influx of new people by children being born uh, um, to keep the, uh, the epidemic cooking, let's say. Whereas in Iceland, if you have an outbreak, ev more or less everyone who has had the disease uh, uh, gets measles and then there are no cases around to keep the epidemic cooking. So the distinct, distinction between these two population size is called the critical community size. And that's something that people want to understand. How big is the critical community size and what factors does it depend on? Does it depend on duration of the infectious period? Does it depend on something called R0, which I will come back to later? Here is another picture, uh, uh, a graph, and this is for HIV in Sweden. It is from the start of HIV in, in the early 80s, and we see there was a big peak then, whereas now it seems to stabilize. Perhaps it is slightly increasing, we can see. And questions that are asked for HIV is, within the risk groups, is it growing or is it on decline? What can we do to make uh, the incidence drop? What type of preventive measures are, uh, are uh, effective? And also another thing is in terms of data analysis, what type of data can we collect? And for HIV, it's possible nowadays to also collect sequences from the viruses. And can that be used to make us learn more about the spreading mechanisms? So that was reality. So now we go to mathematics, which is home turf for me. So mathematician, the job of an applied mathematician is to describe reality. And the main idea is to simplify reality. So from the complex reality, we simplify it to a fairly simple model, capturing the main features of the model, and then you try to analyze this model to say something of what will happen and to, understand the, uh, to better understand the phenomenon. And later on, you might include more and more reality into your model. Today, I will only talk about the simplest type of model because time is restricted. So I will now present the simplest possible uh, model for inf the spreading of an infection. I assume that there is no immunity in the community. That's not too hard to include in the model, but for now, let's assume there is no initial immunity. Another simplification is that we assume all individuals are the same. You're equally susceptible. If you get infected, you're in equally infectious. And also, we assume that you mix homogeneously in the community. And we consider diseases that once you recover, you become immune. There are other diseases where you go back to being susceptible, but in this lecture, I will talk about uh, the situation where you, after having recovered, you become immune, at least for the time being. These models are called SIR models, susceptible, infectious, removed, or recovered. I also assume that people don't change behavior during the course of the epidemic. Of course, that's not true in reality, in particular for dangerous diseases. But for now, let's assume that you don't change behavior during the ep epidemic. So what is this model then? Well, it's a discrete time model. So we move things step by step. Maybe you can think of week by week. We have a population, a closed population. The population size we call N. Maybe n is 1,000 or 10,000 or a million. So we don't, we're not really interested in too small population sizes. And we start the epidemic with everyone except one person being susceptible. So n minus one people are susceptible and one single person is infectious. And as I said, no immunity, so no recovered individuals. And then the model is as follows. Suppose I am the, the one infected person, then I am infected today and next week, by next week, I will have infected each other individual independently with some probability that we call P. So I infect uh, Bob with probability P and with probability P and so on. You can think of more or less like you toss a coin, an unfair coin, which says infection with probability P and no infection with probability 1 minus P. And then you do this, and then next week, maybe the result was that I infected three other people. These three people, for the week thereafter, they toss the same type of coin, 
to every other individual. They don't have to cause a to uh, toss a coin to me because I have already been infected and by now I am immune. So they, you only have to toss coins to uninfected individuals and they do this. So maybe these three people in total infect an additional 10 people and then the next time, the next stage, these 10 people toss their coins and so on. Eventually, a, a larger and larger number will have been infected, so there are fewer and fewer susceptibles remaining to toss the coins with. So that will make the, uh, the epidemic start declining after, eventually. Because, of course, not more, than, not more than everyone can get infected, so the epidemic eventually stops. Maybe everyone gets infected, more likely not everyone gets infected, but a certain fraction. Okay, so this is the model. We toss the coins, those that I infect, they toss their coins, those that they infect, they toss their coins, and so on. And we have one probability parameter, which is called P, and then we have the population size, which is called N. The most important quantity of all is called the basic reproduction number, and it is defined as the average number of infections, infections caused by one infected person. And what is then the basic reproduction number for this model if, let's say, P is 0 0.0015 and the population size is 1,000? Well, think of it, I toss a coin to 1,000 other people, or let's say 900 other people, and each time it's a probability 0 0.0015. Well, the average number of people that I, I will infect will then be the product of these two. It's the P times the population size. So in the numerical example, uh, our, the basic reproduction number is 1.5. And then that is the model. So then you might ask yourself, what will happen with this model? How, uh, how many will get infected? Another thing you might ask is, how will, this num how will the incidence vary over time? I will come back to the later question, but let me start by first uh, just discussing how many will get infected ultimately. And uh, before doing some mathematics, uh, I've done some simulations. So I've simulated this type of epidemic in a community of size 1000. I've chosen two values of P corresponding to R0 equals 0 0.8 and R0 equal to 1.5. And I have simulated this in this population, but I haven't simulated it once. I've simulated it 10,000 times. And I've kept the final number getting infected, which is called the final epidemic size. I've collected that from each of the 10,000 simulations. And on the next two slides, you, I plot a histogram of the final sizes of the number of infected cases. So here comes uh, the, the histogram. First, the first histogram is for R0 equal to 0 0.8. And then we see that for all 10,000 simulations, there was no big outbreak. We see that all simulations are concentrated close to zero. So maybe 5 or 10 or even 20 got infected, but never more than 30 or 40 people got infected. So the, all 10,000 simulations resulted in a small epidemic outbreak. This was for R0 equal to 0 0.8. How about when R0 is 1.5? Well, then we see that a completely different situation. We see that there is still quite a lot of small outbreaks, but then there is another um, bulk of outbreaks uh, around uh, or slightly less than 600. So it seems like either you have zero, a fraction zero getting infected or around 60% getting infected. You never see outbreaks with 30% infected, and you never see outbreaks of 80% infected. So that's a little bit surprising. And that's something that we mathematicians have been trying to understand and worked on. If you have taken some probability or seen something about that, you might even guess that if you see the bulk around 600, you might even guess that it looks like a normal distribution, and that is actually something that has been proven, that as the population size tends to infinity, it would be concentrated around this value, but there is a normal distribution around this uh, value as well. Okay, 
So the conclusion was that uh, either very few get infected or else a positive fraction, which I call tau, will get infected. And the latest situation only happens if the basic reproduction number is bigger than one. Why is this the case? Well, I haven't proven that here for you, but you might imagine this to be the case because suppose that on average you infect less than one person. Well, if I start, I might by chance still infect two, but they will not infect that many. Maybe they will infect fewer, so eventually it will drop down to zero. Whereas if R0 is bigger than one, let's say it's two, I infect two people, they on average infect four new people, and so on. So then you have something exponentially growing. So the value one is called the critical value, and it's only if it's above one that you have, a that you have possibility for a major outbreak. Uh, and maybe to a surprise, it's quite easy to derive an equation for the final size, which I call tau. And I will do that now. Uh, let me just remember that tau is then the final size, the fraction of people getting infected. So then n times tau is the number of people getting infected. And the transmission probability, which I call p, is equal to R0 divided by M, because I defined R0 as M times P, so that means that P must equal to R0 divided by M, and that is the transmission probability. So now comes an equation for uh, how to derive the, the final fraction getting infected. Tau is the final fraction getting infected, so that means that 1 minus Tau is the fraction not getting infected. And the fraction not getting infected is, from an individual perspective, the same thing as the probability not to get infected. And what is the probability not to get infected in the model? Well, the probability not to get infected is the probability that you avoid being infected from all those people that were infected who tossed their coins towards you. And it, for each coin, the probability not to get infected is 1 minus p. And since there was uh, n times tau people getting infected, the total probability of not getting infected is 1 minus p raised to the power n times tau. So 1 minus tau must equal 1 minus p to the power n times tau. N times tau. And then we rewrite p as r naught over n. And then we use uh, an approximation which is well known in mathematics and if you haven't seen it I'm afraid that I can't explain this now but that says that 1 minus something small raised to something large is very close to uh, the exponential function and that's what this formula says. So we end up with the following equation that 1 minus tau is equal to e to the minus r naught tau. And R0 is something that is given to us, or for any disease, there is a specific R0. And then that equation gives a solution to for a particular value of R0. Unfortunately, that equation is a little bit more complicated than many equations you've seen in school. It's not possible to give an explicit solution for what to is. But you can compute it numerically very easy. And what comes now is a, a graph of this solution as a function of R0. So here it is. We see that for R0 values smaller than 1, we see that the solution is tau equals 0. Whereas when R0 is larger than 1, we see that the, the, the size of the outbreak grows very quickly up to, towards 1. For instance, in my numerical example, if you, uh, I had R0 equal to 1.5, if you f follow this graph, if you take the value 1.5 and follow it up to where you meet the curve, you see that this happens just below uh, uh, 0 0.6. If I remember correctly, the numerical value is 0.583. So this says then that the final size, if you have R0 equal to 1.5, is slightly smaller than 60%. And this agrees very well with our simulations, which said that uh, close to 60% got infected in those situations where you have a big outbreak. So 
this simulation, in a sense, confirms this formula that it holds true, at least for R not equal to 1.5. And hopefully you believe me that it also holds if I would have chosen a different R naught. Okay, so that was the final size as a function of R naught. And the main observation was that if the basic reproduction number is smaller than one, then we have no major outbreak. I'll come back to that later. Uh, the results, uh, or the final size, expression for the final size was based on three assumptions, which I mentioned earlier, but let, let me come back to these. The first one was that there is no immunity, neither natural immunity or vaccination. This is true for coronavirus, for instance, and that is one reason we see such a big outbreak. If there is immunity, either by vaccination or natural immunity, the curve looks very different, as I will show uh, on the next slide. The second assumption was that I assumed that people were completely homogeneously and that they mixed homogeneously. That is, of course, not true for corona or for any epidemic disease. And this is something that people do a lot of research on, trying to understand what heterogeneities there are in the community. This depends on what type of disease you consider and what the effect is. However, quite often the result is that if you include a lot of heterogeneity, the final size drops a little bit, but not dramatically. Let's say between 10 and 20 percent uh, as a rule of thumb. The third assumption was that we don't change our behavior during the outbreak. And that is, of course, much harder to, well, it's easy to model that you change your behavior, but it's very hard to know in what way people change their behavior. So it's very hard to fit such a model to reality. But I will not uh, discuss three very much now. Uh, but on the next slide, uh, which I come to now, I will plot the final size, not only for the base model, but only for two, also for two other situations. One is where you have a heterogeneous community, and the other one is where you have uh, immunity, prior immunity. So the blue curve is the one we had before. And then the dashed curve, that is in a community that is rather heterogeneous. In fact, I did this curve for a model where half of the community is three times more susceptible than the other half. The conclusion is that, as I said, there is the, low, the final size is smaller, but it's not a dramatic difference. The, the third curve, the, the orange curve, that is when there is uh, immunity in the community, in particular, uh, or specifically, I assume that 50% of the community was immune before the outbreak. And we see that that curve is very different, in particular for moderate sized values of R0. For instance, if R0 is equal to 1.5, we see that if there is, um, uh, if 50 percent are immune, we see that no one gets infected, as compared to 58 percent getting infected. So prior immunity plays a very big role, whereas heterogeneity plays only a minor role. Let me say a few words about this uh, fundamental quantity R naught, the basic reproduction number. One way to look upon it is to uh, write it as a factor of three, uh, as a product of three factors. So you can write R0 as P times C times L, where P is the transmission probability given a contact. So if you meet some uh, closely, what is the probability that if that person is infected and I'm susceptible, what's the probability that I get infected? That is P. The second factor called C is the rate at which you meet new people. So uh, the number of contacts per day, let's say. And then the final factor, L, that's the duration of the infectious period. This is a nice way to write the basic reproduction number in the sense that it gives guidance to preventive measures. Uh, all preventive measures aim at reducing the reproduction number. In particular, you want to reduce it such that it drops below one, because then, as we said before, there will be no outbreak. And you can attack reduction or not, either by reducing P, or reducing C, or reducing L, or of course all three of them. And there are a lot of different ways of reducing these parameters. A few examples are the following. For instance, reducing the transmission probability 
is you wearing face mask. I think it's believed that for Corona, if you are infectious and wear a face mask, you reduce re the risk of infecting others. Also washing your hands reduces the risk of both infecting others and getting infected. If we're interested in sexually transmitted infections, then wearing a condom at the intercourse reduces transmission probability drastically. How do you reduce the contact rates, the rate at which you meet people? Well, that's very natural to understand. I mean, if you stay home, you meet fewer people. So if you quarantine yourself, if you avoid public transport, you avoid public events, there are many ways of reducing the rate at which you meet other people. And finally, how do you reduce the length of the infectious period? Well, what happens in your body? Well, with treatment, that would be one possibility, but there is no treatment for corona. But um, if you isolate yourself, of course, you're still infectious, but somehow your effective infectious period has then stopped. Also, for many diseases, most of the spreading takes place before you know that you're diagnosed. So trying to diagnose people quicker is one way to shortening the, act, the effective infectious period. For instance, HIV, I think the current time being infectious before being diagnosed in Sweden is around two years. And it is believed if this was possible to drop down to, let's say, one year, HIV would not vanish in the community, but it would drop dr drastically if that was possible to do. Okay, so the aim with any preventive measure is to reduce the basic reproduction number. Suppose that we manage to do this, to reduce it by a factor um, C. Then the new reproduction number is then 1 minus C times uh, the basic reproduction number. So it is the factor which we have not reduced, so that what remains. And from before we know that if the new reproduction number is smaller than one, then we will not see a major outbreak. So that is the goal, the ultimate goal with all preventive measures. We want to reduce the effective reproduction number below one. And if you look at this simple equation, that is equivalent to saying that you want this reduction factor C to be larger than one minus one upon R naught. This is the main explanation to why it's very important to, to know what R0 is because it gives guidance to how much you have to reduce spreading in order to avoid an epidemic outbreak. Okay, Let, uh, let's go back to reality slide, uh, for a short while. So here is this curve for the corona epidemic outbreak. So what is R0 for this curve? Well, in fact, or unfortunately, it is not possible to determine R0 by simply observing this, uh, this curve. The only thing you can say from observing this curve is that R0 is larger than 1. Why is that? Well, th this growth curve that we just saw has an exponential growth that uh, we can call it exponential growth R. And this rate of growth depends on two factors, not only R0, but it also depends on something called the generation time. And the generation time describes the time between getting infected and, infected and infecting others. And the shorter the generation time, the quicker is the epidemic growth. The larger R0 you have, the quicker epidemic growth you have. That means that there are many combinations of, of generation time and R0 that can give rise to this curve. So this curve could be either with a small R0 and a small generation time or a large reproduction number and a large generation time. So we cannot say what R0 is by simply observing this curve. However, if we also know something about the generation time, and that's possible to learn, for instance, by contact tracing, and contact tracing, you, you look for people that have been infected, and you try to understand when they were infected, so then you, you get some information about the generation time. And with information of the generation time, together with this uh, incidence curve, it is possible to estimate or not. Okay, now we talk about what happens through time. So on the next page, I will put the fraction of infectious people over time for this model. I will both look at the situation where the basic reproduction number is 3 
but also for the situation where we have managed by, uh, to re reduce the reproduction number, let's say down to two. From before, we know what happens with the final size. If you would read off the curve, uh, when R0 is equal to three, slightly more than 90% would get infected, whereas if R0 is equal to two, uh, slightly less than 80% get infected. Some what of a difference, not huge, but there are other more striking differences that are uh, obvious from the following uh, curves. The red curve is for R0 equal to three, and the blue cur curve is for R0 equal to two. So there are two differences. The most striking one is that we see that the size of the peak when we have reduced the reproduction number is dramatically lower, close to 50% lower. The second difference is that the timing of the peak has been delayed. It hasn't been delayed by a factor two, but close to a factor two. These two th things are very good news for hospitals because it means that if we manage to reduce it down to two, it means that the number of patients needing uh, intensive care will drop by close to one half and also it would be delayed in time giving hospitals more time to prepare themselves. You can maybe imagine what the curve looks like for 1.5. It's an even lower peak with even more delay and if, it, if the reproduction number is below one then, then there is no peak at all. It just drops right away. So let me say a few words about the corona outbreak. Uh, uh, this is of course a bit harder uh, and I'm not an expert on corona outbreak, but let me still say a few words. So I think the common estimate of the basic reproduction number for corona is around 2 to 2.5. This means that if nothing was done, close uh, somewhere between 60 and 70 percent would get infected. That would include some type of heterogeneity in the community. However, quite a lot have done in Sweden and probably elsewhere as well, or I know elsewhere as well. My guess is that still we have not managed to drop the reproduction number below one, but uh, maybe it's uh, used to be 2.5, but now it's maybe 1.5. And I think it, we're putting more and more measures and individuals are behaving more and more concerned. So I think it, it will still decline and hopefully it will drop down to zero, uh, down to one, below one within a few weeks maybe. So how many will get, that will get infected depends very much on what happens with this effective reproduction number and when we manage to re reduce it uh, uh, more. And uh, that's why I don't want to predict anything because it, it's not decided yet. It, is deci it will be decided by us and the community how much efforts we put to reduce spreading. So for now, I, all I can say is that it could be anything between 1% and 60 to 70%. Another question is what happens when the outbreak is over? That is discussed slightly less now. Well, it will not be the case that the coronavirus will vanish from Earth. It will still be around circulating and people getting infected, probably also in Sweden. But if we manage to drop this peak, the, the number of infections and the infections, they will come spread over time and it will, might happen that most of us get infected after one year or at least several months ahead. And, by, and that's very good news because that means that the hospitals, a few of us that get infected will need hospital care. And if this is spread over time, this means that the hospitals will manage. And also, after my guess is that after sometime during the summer there will also be a vaccine available possibly maybe in the autumn so then we can start vaccinating risk groups which is very good for them so pushing down the reproduction number helps postponing when we get infected and it helps the risk groups in the sense that they will then have a vaccine so it's it's very important to try to do that but it will not vanish from the earth and probably in a few years we will be uh, talking about the seasonal corona rather than the seasonal influenza or maybe they will both be circulating that I don't know. So let me end by saying that what, what do uh, we mathematicians and statisticians do? I've been working in this area for 20 years. So what are we working on? Well, right now most of us work on the corona outbreak, but otherwise what we do? Well, there are a lot of things that need to be better understanding. I mentioned already these different types of heterogeneities and space, let's say, that uh, 
people are distributed in space, how does that affect uh, the spreading mechanism? I would say that that is not well enough understood. Another one is how it spreads between countries and what is the effect of uh, reducing travel, uh, imposing travel restrictions. How does that affect spreading mechanism between countries? Very important is, of course, to try to understand what happens with different preventive measures. And here statisticians are important because it's quite easy to say what will happen if school closing reduces transmission between kids by 50%. That's very easy to say what will happen then. But statisticians can hopefully help us saying what will be the reduction of transmission between children if schools are closed. Um, another thing that statisticians can help us with is trying to say what type of data needs to be collected to answer these questions. And that's a very important question. But I must confess that many of us also do this because we like the underlying mathematics and its beauty. So that's fortunate for us. With these words, I would like to thank for your attention. Thank you very much.